Hello and welcome back again to ASFC Chemistry where I'm going to take you through the essentials of why and how we can use thin layer chromatography. Now thin layer chromatography, we use something like a uh, TLC plate or we can use paper chromatography for this and this is actually going to be our stationary phase in our chromatography which I'll come back to later. So this is, like I said, it's either um, a TLC plate, which is a sil silica coated piece of glass or plastic, or it could just be some chromatography paper, which is just sophisticated paper for this. The point is that it's very absorbent. And so a solvent, which we're going to use shortly, is going to be able to absorb right up that. Now at the bottom, just here, I've got my sample line, which is what this is called. And here I've got three dots. Now, before we go any further about that sample line, you need to make sure that in real terms, you would draw the sample line with a pencil. And the reason is ink can actually contain often lots of different components that could be soluble in what we're going to use here, and it can disturb the sample. And so we want to make sure that we use a pencil for that. Now, what I've got on that line at the moment, most importantly, I've got my mixture in the middle just here. And my mixture is full of lots of components. And the reason, well, one of the reasons that I'm running the TLC is to try and figure out how many components that is. Now, what I've also got on here are samples of, well, two pure samples of organic compounds, X and Y. And what I'm gonna be able to do by running this um, mixture alongside X and Y is see if the mixture contains X or Y, which allows me to identify parts of it and also look for bits that aren't X and Y and try and uh, do some follow up with that, which is what we're going to look at shortly. So this is what the whole start of this looks like before I add my solvent. Then what would happen is I would add my solvent to this. And so I would dip this plate or paper into uh, the solvent, which is the line I've just drawn on there. And the solvent is actually described as the mobile phase. So we've got stationary phase, mobile phase just here. And what's going to happen is the solvent is going to absorb up all the way up to here. Can you see the dotted line? That is going to be the solvent front. It's essentially how far the solvent is allowed to travel before we take the plate out of the solvent, for instance. And it's going to absorb all the way up. And depending on two main factors, we're going to see that these spots separate out along with the movement of the solvent through the paper or across the TLC plate. And it allows us to see how many things we've got. So how does that work? Well, if we look at the after shot just here, you can see that my sample is completely lifted through and across the TLC plate as the solvent's absorbed up to this solvent front line that I decided just here. Now, you can see here that X, and it was a pure sample of X at the start, has given this spot, and that there is a corresponding spot from the mixture alongside X. So that means my mixture is very likely to contain X. And the same thing can be said for Y at the top just here. But you'll notice, obviously, that X and Y are at two completely different levels. Now, we can actually compare these two together by using RF values. And if I just do X, for example, just here, let's just do a line across for X just there, then X's uh, line just here, its component uh, spot would have two uh, factors to consider in order to calculate an RF value. You would need to consider how far the solvent front is, which is the distance between the sample line and where it gets up to the solvent front. So let's call that value A. And how far the spot travels, and so that would be and to find out the retention factor, you simply do B divided by A. And the bigger this value, so the bigger it gets, sorry, that does say bigger, the bigger it gets, that corresponds to that it's traveled very, very far. So a bigger value would be seen for Y and a smaller value would be seen for X just there to describe that. So we could compare those two together in terms of their RF values. So why has Y traveled further? Why has Y traveled further? What a good choice of letters. So Y has traveled further because of two main things that we need to consider. How attracted it was to the stationary phase and how soluble it was in the mobile phase, which was a solvent in this case. 
So the suggestion would be that Y would be very soluble, choice of words, soluble in the mobile phase. Because as the solvent went up, Y went with it, which means it must be soluble in it because it's able to travel with it all the way up the plate. Similarly, you were traveling across a stationary phase. And so Y mustn't have a great level of attraction for the stationary phase because it was able to travel over it quite easily. So that is why Y has traveled the furthest and got the largest RF value. In contrast, just to make that really clear, X could be insoluble in the solvent, our mobile phase, and so wasn't able to travel with it as it went up, and or it could be very attracted to the stationary phase. The exam questions tend to ask you to put it in one focus. So they'll ask you about how it was soluble in the mobile phase, for instance. And so you wouldn't need to mention both, but I would always mention both just in case if it's not very clear by the question. But I suppose that's just another reminder to read the question very carefully. So we also seem to have something in the middle here, a green dot. And the green dot wasn't one of the uh, comparisons to the controls just here. So it wasn't X or Y, it could be something else, it could be Z. But actually, it could also be W. That green dot could be two things. Just because it's one dot doesn't mean that it's not two different components or more, for instance. It's just that W and Z could have very, very similar solubilities in the mobile phase or similar levels of how attracted they are to the stationary phase. And so they could both be amino acids, whereas these were a carboxylic acid and an ester, for instance. And so you would need to perhaps try a new solvent to see if you get four spots or more. Or you could try a gas chromatography to try and compare this to that and identify um, another component. Now, gas chromatography is a very, very similar technique to thin layer chromatography. But instead of having a, a solid stationary phase and a liquid mobile phase, it has a gas mobile phase and a liquid stationary. So you talk about how soluble something is in the stationary phase in that instance. What you then look at as well here, you can see that not everything made it as far as the solvent went, for instance, here, not everything made it as far as our uh, mobile phase traveled. In gas chromatography, you expect everything to get to the end so you expect everything to move with that mobile phase, which is a gas like nitrogen or argon, for instance. And it's just a case of how long does it take to get there. And how long it takes to get there is how soluble it is in the stationary phase, for instance. So if something gets to the end very, very quickly, it wasn't very soluble in that stationary phase. Whereas if something does get, so if something takes ages to get all the way to the end, has a very, very long retention time, instead of retention factor, retention time, then it means it was very soluble and so it took ages to travel across it because um, it was uh, absorbed, so it, uh, it was very soluble, it was dissolved there and so it means it takes ages to get all the way through. I hope that clears up some of the comparison as well between thin layer chromatography and uh, gas uh, chromatography, but it, there are lots of videos across YouTube to help you out with that as well and hopefully we'll do one soon alongside it. Um, a final practical point that I just want to reiterate is how we create the spots down here. Just to reiterate that you don't just pour loads of mixture on, you would use like a dot and dry technique. So you add the sample, let it dry, add the sample, let it dry, add the sample, let it dry. I could just keep doing that, but I won't because I know you've got lives to lead. But the point is you wouldn't just chuck it all on at the beginning because otherwise it can run out, for instance, or create too big of a spot and it's not going to give you a very good result. I hope that clears up everything you need to know about thin layer chromatography and I'll leave you to the rest of our playlists. Happy revising.